Tonight, as unprecedented panic withdrawals hit mobile uh, money vending stations, we ask, is it time to reconsider the implementation of this controversial levy some five days already into its implementation? After the break, the professors of economics will have their turn. You welcome back. My name is Raymond Alqua, and tonight we understand from the association that's in charge of mobile money vendors, at least there is massive, unprecedented withdrawal at the various mobile money vending stations. This is largely because of the implementation of the levy, which is just five days into its implementation. Already, we understand we lost the first quarter of this year, and we started in May. Again, the projections have been scaled down from 6.9 billion to some 4.5 billion or so. Is this still worth the distortion? Or we need to rethink the policy? Is it too late to go into it? Joining me via Zoom for this conversation is distinguished professor of economics, Professor John Gachi from the University of Cape Coast. Also joining me via phone is Professor Peter Corte, who is currently the director of the Institute of Social Statistical Economic Research. Gentlemen, you're welcome to our front. Good evening to your discerning viewers and listeners. Now, let me start with you, Professor Corte. Now, we lost the first quarter of this year, so we started in May. Secondly, we are being told there are some exemptions which has reduced the amount of money we are likely to get from the A levy. Is it worth the panic withdrawals we understand is currently happening at the various vending stations? Or we could just pull it off? Um, I, your, your line is a bit faint. I could hear, um, mm. but I think your question is basically um, whether given the panic withdrawal, it's worth continuing with the uh, collection of the e-levy. Uh, I, I, I think we have gone too far to withdraw uh, currently. There's been a lot of investment by the telcos, by government, and, and so on, and by even the financial institutions. So um, I, I, I think it's, it's early days yet. Secondly, um, certainly when, when there are uh, there's a shock or there's, there's a new policy. People react differently. Um, unfortunately, with, with the e-levy, I don't think the dissemination, the education, really went down very well before its implementation. Yes, there were town hall meetings, but I, I don't think that uh, adequately informed people. So obviously, um, those who did not really appreciate the essence of the e-levy um, and, and even for those exempted who didn't, don't even know they're exempted, for those who don't even know that if you cash out money, you don't pay a levy, for those who don't even know that if you withdraw less than 100 cities, sorry, transfer less than 100 cities, you will not pay, they are going to react the way we are seeing. But I believe this, this is an adjustment period. Over time, people would realize or would understand and appreciate the, the whole concept. And, and perhaps um, would continue to use the service. Um, I, I, I don't think we should reverse this at this point. Um, already, you, you see that labor is also agitating that taxes on fuel should be removed. Um, and the president indicated that was going to cost the nation about 4 billion cities. If you withdraw E levy and, and lose 4.5 billion cities, already our revenue generation capacity is uh, uh, not been in the best of shape. So with this too, um, certainly we, we, the government finance machinery is going to grind to a halt. Now, I, I get your point. There are those who are raising concerns about distortions in the system, not worth the amount of money that's been generated out of it, regardless of our need and request for money. How do we take care of those uh, arguments? Well, certainly E-Levy is going to bring some distortion, um, and I have argued time and time and again that we could have started with a lower rate of um, maybe 
0.5 or something above 0.5 percent, that everybody will pay um, with a bit of hesitance or reluctance. Uh, I mean, nobody wants to pay taxes, but with a lower rate, you get everybody on board. At the current rate, you will see some adjustment here and there. But having said that, I have, I believe strongly that if we can use homegrown solutions to raise money to fill the revenue gap, uh, it's better than continuing to borrow. Um, already we have hit our threshold in terms of borrowing. We don't okay. want to continue to borrow. We don't want to go to IMF. Uh, let's use our homegrown solutions. Let's cut uh, our expenditure to, to, to match our revenue stream and, and be prudent. And, and by so doing, we'll be able to continue to develop the country. Uh, going to the IMF, I am a bit reluctant uh, because of the austerity it brings, because of the freeze on employment. Um, youth unemployment currently is just 2%. If we go into a program that is going to restrict employment uh, severely, that will not augur well for us. So um, let's continue and manage the economy and you know, provide some level of employment within the country. Let me keep you on hold for a second, Prof. If you can hold the line for me, there's a question I have for you when I return to this particular point about whether or not the A levy in and of itself is not a drop in the ocean. But let me bring in Professor John Gachi on this point. Panic withdrawal, starting a bit late, and the fact that there are exemptions. Those who are insisting that the E levy currently in this state is not worth continuing with, do you agree with them, Professor Gachi? Who are those people, please? I cannot hear you, Prof. Can, can you hear me? You say some people are, do not agree with the E-Levy. Uh, do I agree with them? No, and no, I'm no. I'm, I'm, who are... Sorry, if you can hear me, Prof, my question is, the, the argument, for example, from the ranking member on the Finance Committee in Parliament, the argument by some other people is that starting in May, not realizing all of the available options for deduction, that's the exemptions introduced, if you put it together, it sends a signal that it's not the 6.9 billion we should be getting, we'll be getting somewhere around 4.5 billion. And that the distortions alone is not worth pursuing this E-Levy for. I'm asking whether you agree with those who hold this view. I think if we engage ourselves and we all agree that uh, we have accepted the E-Levy, then we equally need to give some time to the implementing authority, that is GRA, uh, to uh, identify some of the challenges that are coming up uh, and be able to provide some solutions uh, within the shortest possible time to keep fit uh, with the process because it's the task uh, that is rejected by the people and uh, through uh, numbers in parliament, this uh, uh, e-levy has been passed. So it's, uh, it's not a, a levy that is uh, uh, something encouraged by the public. So it is only important that those who are implementing should do it in an efficient manner so that the uh, the apprehension that people had before the acceptance of the e-levy through the parliamentary process uh, uh, would not be reoccurring in their minds. Uh, we do know that the e-levy uh, is not something that we all agree with because it is not principle. Uh, it doesn't follow any uh, principle of taxation. I think that is a problem by many people. Uh, we do know our roads are constructed one way or the other by taxis, our hospitals, our, 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 our schools, etc. If we see these things happening, we are encouraged, uh, even though it may be difficult to pay in taxis, as people say. But when these things are happening, people pay tax. But taxis are supposed to be arranged based on taxation principle. Uh, be as it, it, it is, uh, we require that efficiency uh, is brought on board in the implementation. I believe that is all that the people uh, are reacting to. Mm. Now, I, I, I get your point. There's a question, though, that I come to you, gentlemen professors, on. 
the argument is that the NDC is very convinced it will cancel this particular tax. In fact, it would remove and repeal it from Parliament as a law in this country. Is it a very feasible plan? Looking at the fact that the options we are looking at is somewhere 2025. Would it be feasible in 2025? Mindful of the economic situation we find ourselves. Would the economy have recovered? Would there be alternatives on the table by 2025 for this to be possible? Well, I don't know what went into uh, the decision of the announcement. I don't know the pillars that have been looked at. But from political economy and taxation policy management, in reality, politicians don't remove taxes. I get your point. <laughs> yes. So you think they're going to do it? Well, I understand we have him frozen on. Let me get you on board, um, Professor Peter Corte. Okay. Do, are you with me, um, Professor Agachi? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Yes, you are so, speaking, but you froze there. I wanted a categorical answer on whether or not this is pure political gimmickry or it's something that can be done. Damn the consequences. Well, I don't think uh, we should just consider it to be a political statement. It is something that is doable because, uh, in my opinion, uh, the former president didn't say that he was just going to abolish or cancel. He said he's going to repeal. Uh, I believe you are aware that we have repealed many laws in this country. Certainly. We are using uh, at 919 for petroleum sector, upstream sector now. We're using uh, PNDC law 84. Uh, that does not mean that we are not managing petroleum. I believe you are also aware that in the financial sector, we have repealed a lot of laws. But new laws have come uh, to make the sector more efficient and the rest. So I believe that the repeal process uh, will, will bring uh, what will be acceptable to the people. Because my opinion is that the main problem of the people of Ghana is not, it's not necessarily the rate uh, 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 that have been slashed on us, it's not even the threshold, but it's the principle. So if you are going to repeal the law, that will bring in a principle-based taxation. I believe that will be acceptable to the people. And if that's the way uh, the former president is thinking, then that is doable. Okay, I get your point. I'm talking about the financial consequences of having to make such a decision like that. Of course, my explanation is that we are talking about repeal. And all the repeal, we have most of the laws that we have repealed. We don't just leave it like that. We brought in what is more efficient and more acceptable to the stakeholders. And if that is the case, then I cannot estimate uh, absolute revenue losses because okay. <laughs> you are just bringing something that will be more acceptable to the people through the repeal process. That is my understanding. Okay. Now, I, I get you. Professor Peter Corte, I wanted your thoughts on this particular point. What will be the consequences of having to repeal such a law, mindful of what we intend to gain from it, and what's likely to be the alternative? Well, it depends on how much you are able to realize at the end of the year. It is very substantial and we repeal it, um, then of course that revenue gap or hole has to be filled in one way or the other. Um, but but um, that, that, that could be done if there is a better alternative. Um, otherwise, um, repealing it would be quite difficult in my view. Okay. And maybe revising it might be um, a bit easier. Mm. So if the rate is revised now, was to maybe 0.5. To make it uh, keep on a cover affordable for everybody, uh, maybe that will be the way to go. But if you repeal that, you have to find an alternative way of filling in a gap. And we know we've always been struggling with our revenue uh, generation uh, process. So um, we, we need to see, we need to see the amount that will be lost, and then to see the alternative that uh, will be provided if it is repealed. Of course, um, taxes have been repealed or taxes have been scrapped. In the past, this is not going to be the first time, but oftentimes they've been nuisance uh, taxes. These are taxes that are not yielding enough revenue. 
and, and then they are refused. But if, if it's using significant revenue, people have adjusted and want to repeal it, then we, we, may, we may suffer the consequences as well. I appreciate your time, Prof. And I appreciate your time, Professor Gachi, too. Uh, Professor Peter Kote is the head of the Institute of Statistical, Social, and Economic Research at the University of Ghana. Professor John Gachi is the head of the UCC Business School. Distinguished professors, thank you so much for joining me. Now, we shift in the go post on this conversation to speak to the man who took on the NDC, the NPP's Director of Communications, Lawyer Yao Babia Samoa, you're welcome to our front. Thank you. I hope you're doing well this evening. By the grace of God, I'm now, doing quite well. I just finished a conversation with two professors. One thinks that it might be a bit difficult, if there are no alternatives available, for us to repeal a levy. The other is of the considered opinion that it's not a big deal. It can be repealed if the replacement is of a substantive nature. You indicated in your press statement that it will be a scam for anybody to believe that the NDC, as was communicated by the former president, will be in the position to repeal this particular bill. After the law, of course, after hearing from the two professors, are you still confident in your opinion on this matter? Absolutely. There is no way the NDC, any NDC government, will scrap the ND, the the E levy. You see, the word you are using is "can." Of course, they can repeal it because it is a mechanical process to repeal a law. It means that if they have a majority in parliament, by the grace of God, which I assume will not happen, if the NDC has a majority in parliament, they can send an act to parliament to repeal the the. The uh, E-Levy Act, the existing act, that's how it's done. So if they have the numbers in parliament, yes, they can. But the real question you should be asking them is, will they? And that is where I am confident that they will not. I thought that was pretty <laughs> clear. I thought that was pretty <laughs> clear that... No, they... you were not putting it clearly. When you say, can they, then you are implying that something blocks them from it. Oh, I see. When you say, can they, mm. but... In, in, in technical, mechanical terms, they can. Okay. But they will not. They will not because of two or three factors. One, it is one of the conditionalities that they and the uh, the the uh, uh, their partners, the multilateral agencies, will insist on to demonstrate a revenue stream that works. And as it stands, if the IMF and the World Bank and then the rating agencies all want you to deliver a revenue stream that works, then clearly you will be in a very good position to say that, well, e levy is already working because in another one and a half years to two years before the election, I believe that we can work out the kinks, the difficult implementation kinks, the administrative issues can all be worked out. And also the utility of it itself. You know, we talk about the incidents of tax. I heard Professor Gachi, but... Uh, look at the utility of the e levy, the, the ease with which it can be collected, and as well as the way in which it can be managed and, and clearly used. There's a certain utility to it. So I'm expecting that revenues may grow, uh, the e levy uh, uh, envelope, where it can be taken from, the e market, the internet market that e levy depends on now, may grow between another up to two to two and a half billion uh, uh, trillion cities by the time we get to the election. And that means oh, that... Oh, I see. Is that a projection of government? No, I'm, I'm making that projection as I speak to you. Oh, okay. I get you. If you look at, if you look at uh, the growth from... The exponential growth since interoperability became effective from 78 billion in 2016... And the interoperability swung in and came into effect beyond 2018. And now we have one trillion as at the end of 2021. The sheer utility of it is that it's likely to keep, keep growing. If you end 2022 at one and a half trillion, you are likely to end up in 2024 at two trillion, which means even at 1.5%, the envelope will grow larger. And that is a major source of internal income 
that will be difficult to scrap. Because if they scrap it, and I heard my professors right, they're saying that if there's an alternative, what's the alternative? The 17.5 percent on finance, 17 for 5 percent VAT on financial transactions. How feasible is that? Which transactions and how much will it bring in to, to satisfy the uh, multilateral partners and to satisfy the rating agencies? What about the uniform tax that the NDC plan and put in their manifesto? What kind of tax will it be? It will just be e-levy in disguise. They will name it NDC levy or they will name it NDC tax or they will name it electronic tax or what will they name it? Whatever the name is, it will be drawn from the internet, the same way the e-levy is drawing on the internet. And the incidents may even be higher. You'll be surprised no, that the incidents may be higher. Let, so, let, let me be <laughs> fair. You made reference in your statement to... Um, specifically, I'm quoting you. In any event, can John Mahama explain the difference in his 17.5 tax on financial transactions and his manifesto pledge to impose a uniform tax on all electronic transactions? Are these measures e-levy in disguise? And does he stand, does he stand by them? Are they not significantly different from the e-levy? How can a uniform tax on all electronic transactions be different from e-levy? But... The, e levy the, is a uniform tax on all electronic transactions. The, is it, is it, is it, it is. is. What is, is it? it? Is it the exact wording? If I could reference what they have told me yesterday, uh, Atto Fossi was the, of the opinion that you are misconstruing the two, that the uniform tax will be in the financial sector, existing taxes, not new ones. He said they need to be harmonized rather than increasing them or introducing new ones and not a fresh levy like the e-levy is currently doing. That is what he says it meant when they put it in the manifesto. Do you realize, do you realize, that, do you realize that the Momo market is part of the financial services industry? Yes, that but... Does that too realize that with interoperability, your, your bank account is on your phone, and that when you are transacting with your bank on your phone, it's an electronic transaction. So but, what is the difference now? But no e-levy was currently... Prior to the introduction of e-levy, there was no e-levy, right? Yes. Yes, so what he's saying e is that but we are just we just agreed to do a, a, a harmonization of what's existing. We have not put in it in our manifesto. That's what he's telling us, that we are going to introduce... What? If it didn't exist, what are they harmonizing? Rula, if it didn't exist, what are they harmonizing? No, no, no. They are not talking about e-levy. They are saying that they are currently, as we speak, original. Because, they are, of course, if I transfer money from my bank account to another one, there are, there are some financial transaction tax that they pay on it. But that's not e-levy, right? The cost of turnover transaction is an internal bank transaction. Brilliant. Brilliant. Is that taxed? That's taxed, right? The cost of turnover. It is taxed as part of the bank's revenues, isn't it? Brilliant. It is taxed as part of the bank's corporate taxes, but, isn't it? But it's, so, so it's not my 15,000 CDs that's being taxed. Like the way E-Levy is taxing the 15,000 in my momo if I'm transferring it. I hope you get the difference. Rola, there's no difference. The difference is that they have to come and explain it better. Ah, I see. Because the taxes, they are harmonizing. What taxes are they? Because the tax they had in the financial sector has been repealed by the MPP. I get you. That was the 17.5%. But the 17.5%, so it was not on the amount of money I was transferring, right? Bro, let the NDC come and explain. That's why I asked them a okay. question. All right. Are they standing by it? And what are they going to name it? And where will the incidents be? Because if you are looking at the typical tax profile, we want to know where the incidence is whether it to be regressive or progressive, all those things. They should come and answer about that in their manifesto, which says that they will have a uniform tax across all electronic transaction platforms. If you use a point-of-sale device, it will be electronic. If you use uh, 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 an ATM, it's electronic. If you use Momo, it's electronic. So what exactly will they be doing that is different from the e-levy? I get your point. Now, th there's this other point you made about the one-time one -time premium. That never saw the light of day. Exactly. I use it to illustrate the fact that Hello. the NDC can make all manner. Uh. Hello? Hello? Are we there? 
Am I there? Yes, please go Can ahead, sir. Uh -huh. I use it to illustrate the fact that the NDC can make all manner of political promises based on the angst of the day. But they may never have an intention to keep those promises. And it's the one time premium is one such promise. When they tried to convince Ghanaians that it was not necessary to pay a tax every month. It was not necessary to pay a levy for your health every month by way of insurance premium. And that they were going to make you pay it once in a lifetime and you wouldn't pay again. It was preposterous. It is not a principle known to insurance. But politically, they pushed it very hard. And then in the end, when they came to power, they abandoned it and, and swept it away without it being by your leave to the people of Ghana. Mm. They simply swept it away. And this is the same thing that can happen with the eleven, Because now, they are riding on the feelings of the people. And, and we all agree, as the professors were observing, that it's not been easy to introduce. As we speak, I think one of the huge areas that we must continue dialogue is service providers, especially Momo service providers, because implementation depends on them. They have to understand what they are implementing, and then the platforms for collection from the, uh, uh, the, the ISPs and all that. These are technical things, as well as education and dialogue things that we must get right. But this is the time to get them right. Because it's a teething period. Perhaps if we had the luxury of testing out a, a tax, we could have piloted it. But unfortunately, you can't have the luxury of piloting a tax. It's, so it's, we have to go well, ahead. We don't have put all the things in place before we started this particular tax. Already, but we've that's heard. That's what we are trying to do. We, we've but, heard. Well, whatever you do, there will always be a teething problem. Whatever oh. you do, there will be a teething problem. What must happen is that the preparedness must be up to scratch so that mm. they can handle the teething problems. The, the preparedness cannot anticipate all the problems. But once the problems come forth, they must be in a position to resolve the problems quickly. That is what will give confidence to the people. So that people don't say that because of these implementation mistakes, okay. let us walk away from it. You can't do that. It's not right. The mobile money vendors... Be able to meet... Yes, I was asking the, the question. Of, yes, the mobile money vendors have already said... There is an unprecedented um, level of withdrawals currently happening. They call it panic withdrawals. Is there any way government can switch the fears of the people doing these panic withdrawals? Oh, yeah. I, I, I think it's dialogue is required. And I think that we must see the Momo vendors as a very critical group that we engage. We cannot assume that they understand. We cannot. I, I have done a few. I have tested not from my phone, but I've gone to vendors and, and tried to appreciate their understanding of what is going on. Many, many of them, uh, we shouldn't assume and understand. And so the, the, the vendors have to be targeted as a group and, and engaged and taught very, very importantly, because it's a major, major source. Okay. It is the utility of that uh, 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 tax is so high because using the interoperability platforms for financial transactions is extremely convenient. It's convenient for everybody. And, and, and that convenience uh, cannot be offset by the level of the tax, 1.5%. There are even service providers who don't take service fees. And therefore, all they have to administer is this tax. And there are service providers whose service fees are higher than the tax. So somehow, people are a bit comfortable with their service charges already. We just have to get them to appreciate that perhaps this is another service charge that you have to deal with. But definitely, the vendors are a key stakeholder group that we must deal with. Now, there's a question, though, about when you talked about talk tax, that um, there was, a, there was a, there's a promise to repeal the talk tax that John Mahama and the NDC promised, but failed to implement when they were in power. Yesterday, um, Kessel, out of forces of the opinion, there was no such promise to repeal the talk tax. What's the source of this claim you make? The, the, when you go back to the era of the talk tax, Roland, it's so interesting. It's like free SHS. When the NBC went to the extent of sponsoring over 42 ads against free SHS, today officially the NBC will tell you that we, we didn't do that because vendors were the ones who, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 volunteers 
and, and, and groups associated with the party were the ones who sponsored those adverts. But they were a key part of the rejection of free SHS in the 2012 uh, election, uh, 2008 and 2012, that the NDC went all out, all manner of adverts against free SHS. And the same thing that happened with doctors. It is called the communication service tax. Yeah. How did it come to be called the talk tax? It's because of the dialogue that went on, the, 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 the cacophony around it, especially from the NDC. If you recall, they were saying that if we are taxing talk, which is God giving, then we'll be taxing air. <laughs> Do you remember? The, 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 you are being put to street proof. They are saying when and where the Jehovah say he will repeal. I, I am not on this Zoom meeting to tell you exactly when or where. The records are there. I can find it for them. Frankly, I've not found me, any. So I'm asking you because... Funded. You can also fact check. No, I, I'm asking you because that's what I do. I've not found any yet. Specifically, he, John Dramani Mahama, saying that he would repeal, or the NDC will it, repeal, it, it, the it communication service tax. It is not your mama who said that he will repeal communication service tax. If you want, I'll find you the exact personality who said it. I'm I'll be glad to right know now. that. I will find it for you. But it is a fact that they oppose the CST heavily. That they didn't want it to happen. And that they stirred up sentiment against it. They said that if I, the MPP was fact, allowed to tax talk... There's evidence on the internet will, about... There's evidence on the internet about some members of the NDC opposing the talk tax, 100%. I found some of them. What I didn't find is that of John Dramahama saying he'll repeal it. That's my problem. I didn't say John Dramahama. I didn't say John Dramahama. I said NDC. Oh. <laughs> I didn't say John Dramahama. I said NDC. <laughs> am, I, am I quoting you wrong? For you. Forgive me, but I'm quoting your press statement. It says, just like yeah, the one-time premium. I'll find it for you. And the repeal of the talk tax. I'll yes. find it for you. Yeah, okay. So that's why I got confused because I, I thought I, I, I'm the one who misconstrued what you said, said in there. No, no, no. Anyway. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. I, didn't say, I didn't say John Mahama said it. Okay. okay. At that time, he didn't have enough power in the NDC to say it. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting to know. <laughs> anyway. Now, <laughs> let me move on to some other issues you had raised. Mm -hmm. You raised, and I'm quoting you here, if we reflect deeply... We will accept, as the records show, that significant change to our political institutions and conduct, economic structure, and management, and positive social impact has mostly happened under the MPP's watch. Is it, is it you talking about from MPP and ACOFOR and now, or just now? Yes, throughout the Fourth Republic. Brilliant. So which specific significant changes are we talking about? Oh. Uh, uh, if you take politics, we've been very involved in the expansion of the political space, politics and governance. We've been very involved. The, the many of the reforms through the electoral process were initiated, driven through by the MPP and adopted by the nation. If, if you start from when we had the uh, black, uh, opaque black ballot boxes, which were put in rooms secretly, and, and one had to go and vote alone, secretly, and anything could happen. And, and in an era where this encouraged the culture of ballot snatching and, and ballot substitution with the associated violence, and we fought, MPP fought for uh, uh, ID cards, transparent ballot boxes, uh, voting, the open, and all that. Today, uh, including in 2012, uh, fighting for uh, the, uh, the biometric ID card. This, as we speak, has culminated in perhaps the cleanest electoral album and some of the strongest voting systems ever. So, so we've done our bit to stabilize political processes through elections. We have also managed to establish six extra regions within the law, not outside the law, within the law, as provided by the law. We attempted to do a referendum to change Article 55, and the president is still open to that. And so, beyond that, you look at the political process, look at what has happened with the Vigilantism Act. Now, we have forgotten 
the names and titles of the amorphous groups who were becoming political terrorists. And I can say, whether we like it or not, that Nanako demonstrated serious political will in getting the two major parties to sit together under the auspices of the National Peace Council and to get us to dialogue to the point where formally we have dissolved all these groups and we are going forward uh, more or less uh, in a manner that we have a law that protects most of us from mm. the depredations of, of political uh, excesses, particularly in terms of violence. So, so on the political front, we have done quite a lot. On the economic front, <laughs> who took us out of Pic Hippic, took us into Pic Hippic, and took us out of Hippic in record time, and got our debts relieved, took us from Hippic, highly indebted poor country, to a lower middle income country. It was an MPP administration, a third world country who was taking it to lower middle income country with a quadrupling of our GDP. It was the same government which found oil in commercial quantities. And this is one of the things the NDC fought against. Even after the oil was found, they insisted it was, uh, 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 what do you go, palm kernel oil. When it was shown to them in parliament, they said it was palm kernel oil. So the entire front where we are changing the economy, the new economy, is dependent on the MPP. Look at what we have decided to do with bauxite. It will be bold enough to try and establish a bauxite refinery in Ghana. And it comes with a modern butter agreement where we will get infrastructure whilst being able to put up our bauxite refinery. The, the increases in foreign exchange that will come. Uh, we have also been able to attract five of the six most reputable international automobile companies into Ghana. And as we speak, they are assembling vehicles in Ghana. Vehicles are being assembled in Ghana, with, with Ghanaians being trained, being skilled in what they do, and, and being paid commensurately. So, so gradually, we have also put in place the 1D, 1F system where we are getting factories on stream. We are getting new factories, entirely new factories, and we are rehabbing old Ghanaian factories, which were icons before and which were not appreciated, and which are lapsed, and have been brought back to life under the 1D, 1F. So with the economy too, you can see that there is gradual change. We are expanding the spaces for diversification so that we can reduce our reliance on imports and be able to export and increase our foreign exchange. The impact is not only in Ghana. The impact is also across the continent because we have helped to bring the headquarters of the AFTA, African Free Trade Area, into Ghana. And, and that, if we work at it well, will be tremendous. And part of that is the payment system, the PAPS, where you can pay for something in cities in Ghana and buy something in shillings in Kenya. And you don't have to go to a forex bureau to change the money back and forth. So, so we have made major changes on the economic front. I would, uh, and those changes for, are me. to change the structure of our economy. Mr. Yeah. Babia Sama, just hold on a second for me. I will take a break. When I return from mm. this break, we will continue analyzing yeah. the various angles of the statement yeah. you issued. Just give me a second to take a break. Very when well. we return, well, folks, we'll take a break here. And after the break, we'll continue our conversation with the Director of Communications of the MPP. You welcome back. This is Upfront. So we start our conversation with one point out of what the NPP disputes from the statement of the former president John Dramani Mahama at his briefing, which was tagged Ghana at the crossroads. This speech actually brought us to the front of what's happening and where the where the NDC what the NDC will do in connection with the A levy. It says they'll scrap it. They will actually repeal it to so that's what we've been talking about 
First, we had Professor Gachi and Professor Peter Corte uh, discuss this particular point in very serious detail from their points of view. Now, the Director of Communications of the NPP who responded to this particular statement from the former president, Yao Buabina Samoa, is the man who is on with me. We've been trying to understand the statement he issued and the very lengths and breadths of that particular statement. Just before we went on break, we had tried to get to the bottom of this point where he had said significant changes, be it political, economic, and he was on the economic point, and other developments in this country can be attributed to the NPP. And that's the point he was making before we went off. He actually also said many very significant national reverses occurred under the six years of John Muhammad's presidency. He has since been rejected twice in elections. It's possible his recent address is motivated by self-preservation towards his continued leadership of the NDC into 2024, given that both insiders and external observers are writing him, him off. You're welcome back, uh, Director of Communications of the NPP, the Honorable Yao Bwabian Samoa. If you can hear me, sir, you're welcome back. Thank you, sir. Okay, brilliant. Now, there's a point, though, that I need to raise with you. The issues you raised and one of the points you made, you are, you are giving me a litany of developments under the NPP. Now, one of the things you said also in your statement was that both insiders and external observers are writing of John Dramani Mahama as the candidate to lead the NDC into 2024. What's the basis of this claim beyond EIU? <laughs> Why do you want to uh, remove EIU? <laughs> EIU is his biggest worry now. <laughs> EIU I see. is the major external factor. EIU is reflecting the opinion of the externals mm -hmm. because that opinion counts and matters beyond the shores of Ghana. It can change internally, but it matters out there. And since the EIU, John Mahama, you realize, has been up and about trying to reestablish his vision for the people within the NP NDC to accept him as the main king on the block. Because if every eight years, apparently, governments change in Ghana, and then there's an analysis from a respected international body that says that government may change according to the old pattern. However, if it is your mama, it may not be that easy or it is not even likely. It's a direct assault no. on your capacity to lead. My interpretation of the wording was it's that they are, the NDC is expected to brighten their chances with a new candidate, even though the NDC is expected to win the election. Correct. But merely yeah, because your chances, merely because your chances will be brightened, doesn't mean you don't stand a chance at all. Yeah, but you may lose. It, 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 it introduces. That's why I said that the EIU, by introducing the conundrum of leadership into the analysis, has changed significantly the assumption of an eight-year changeover. The okay. FTC is very complacent now. They believe that the eight-year changeover will happen automatically. And therefore, if you were to take your mama, you wouldn't have a problem. But if EIU says that, yes, the eight-year rule is there, but with your mama, you are in danger of rocking the boat. That means it's not just about eight years. The leadership and the quality of the leadership matters. Wait, I, I think where we are. The clarity in that report was that unemployment, which is one of the issues they read, infrastructure development, and I think a third point was also raised to do with the economy. These are the key issues that will be used in determining the election. And corruption, unemployment, infrastructure development, and corruption. These are the issues they think will drive the MPP into a position, not necessarily the eight-year rule. Yes, no, but let's deal with the eight-year rule first. I see. And internal to the NBC, are those who believe that John Mahama will lose them the election if really? they allow him to go forward. Really? Yes. There are those who are projecting Dr. Dufour. There are those 
who are projecting Mr. Bonsu, the former mayor of Kumasi. There are many who are projecting others because they believe that in truth, your Mahama does not have it. Your Mahama cannot lead them to victory. And that EIU confirms what they have known all along. Whose words so, so, matter most? Okay, Sorry, okay. For, forgive me. Maybe if I ask you this simple question, whose words matter most to mm. you? And whose analysis would you believe? The director of research at the presidency, Dr. Isaac Osu Mensa, I hosted him here. He said their service suggests that Mahama will be and is the preferred leader of the NDC. The EIU has a slightly different... Yes, sir. That's the problem the NDC has. That Mahama has a majority in the NDC, but a significant minority who believe that he can't make it. Okay. And that brings in the leadership wedge, which we are going to fail, and which we are going to use to break the eight, because of the quality of leadership and because of the quality of our programs. And that's where it brings me to the three things you are mentioning. If you talk about employment, obviously, if a Ghanaian is frustrated with the NDP about employment, his refuge is not the NDC. <laughs> the, the NDC doesn't employ. The NDC will go to IMF and they will cut off all employment. The MPP has employed teachers, it has employed nurses, it has employed public servants, it has employed security service people, it has empowered youth through NEIP, it has opened up farming opportunities for many people, and it is still continuing to open up opportunities. It has opened up opportunities in new areas of the economy, in new industries, and it has opened up TVET to train people free if I, secondary education. If I can explore this point yes. a little bit further. One, what's mm. our current unemployment rate? Mm. It's a very <laughs> dicey question. And, and it is one of the questions that I believe we must really empower the Ghana Statistical Service to deliver on. Anything that anybody tells in, in that area, to, in my mind, in my opinion, is a guesstimate at best. It will be a guesstimate. And it will always vary according to the political intentions of the person. But to be the fair... The IMF, the World Bank, they are all estimating. Yeah, we, no, we need... Forgive yeah. me. But just last year, we did a census. They have a figure on that particular one. <laughs> because the, the question of what employment is in the, a country like ours is very, very difficult to determine. At least, I, I still believe... Forgive me, but the question I'm asking you is, what did the statistical service mm -hmm. say was our unemployment rate? I want to know what percentage of that has been reduced by this government. I just want to know. What the I, I, have, I don't have those hard figures right now to give you. So how do we know that all the things you have mentioned, which virtually every government does the same thing, are really making a mark on our unemployment situation? At least the NDC couldn't employ graduates. We have employed graduates who broke the unemployed graduates front. The NDC couldn't employ nurses. We have employed nurses. The NDC couldn't employ teachers. We have employed teachers. The NDC couldn't employ people into the public services. We have done so. The NTC couldn't employ people into the security services. We have done that. In the last five years. We have equipped the security services heavily. Okay. Okay. In the last five or so years, since 2017, how many people have been employed by this government? We have an estimate close to between two and a half, three million. If know, but but if that, you are confident about that. the employment, an estimate is not a perfect way of doing it, right? That, that is why I'm saying that the statistics... And the way we understand employment must be re-looked at consistently. Because if you go into the agricultural sector, and if you go into the apprenticeship sector, you will find that a lot of work is going on that will not be deemed as formal employment, but that is making people earn an income. If you go to the informal sector, there are a lot of people who are engaged in vocations, that will not be regarded as formal employment, and yet we are making more money from what they are doing than people who are in the formal sector. So I am still of the opinion that we need to do a lot more work on, on determining what is employment, and therefore, in our context as Ghana, what qualifies as employment? I get your point. In order point. to beef mm. up the uh, statistics. Yes, I, I, I get your point 100%. Now, there's a point, though, that I want to ask you about. 
you've been quoted widely as saying Ghana is a freest country in our sub-region to practice journalism. Is this quote an ample representation of what you said? Roland, have you ever been threatened? Me? We have. Yes, you. Yeah, mostly because is I asked the question. Right? <laughs> yes. Because you are responsible. Because you are responsible. There are hundreds of thousands of young people who are now working in the media. Literally. I'm sure that if we were to do a census, we know that we have about 300,000 teachers. If we were to do a census, we will be heading towards perhaps 80,000 to 100,000 people who are full-time in media work now across the different media. How many of them have been threatened? And don't forget, the media front is now compounded by fly-by-night op operators, uh, opinion, uh, editorials, uh, one-man political parties merely using a phone and engage in social media and so the space for mischief is very very large but who has really been threatened you can count on your fingers those who allege threats and if you go into it you will find that those people are being tested within the context of the law and are being asked to be responsible for their actions really Hold on, are we saying that no so, sorry sorry the Honorable Kennedy yeah. Japan threatened Erastus Sasari mm. Donko. He said the man should be beaten. Today, the Member of Parliament has not even been invited by the police for questioning. You, I think it's a question you should put to the police. Sorry. It's a question you should put to the police. No, no, no. We've asked the police this question consistently. I'm saying that you say I that they don't go free, but the evidence suggests that they are not dealt with the way they ought to be dealt with. Roland, Roland, I want to again yes. look at the numbers in Rufio. If you be a man, I see. Do you realize that? I get that. So, in the hundreds of young people, thousands of young people like you, brilliant journalists, working, is it a routine thing that your opinions are being cut, that you are being threatened? No, it is not. It's a handful of people who are being blown up because the means for blowing up is there. That's why we are free. In Ghana, you can blow anything up in the media and get away with it. We are very, very free. But the few incidents that happen, of course, can be used to characterize depending on how we attack and target and report. So you can report one incident and use it to color the rest of the media. I see. But I am telling you that as far as I'm aware, as far, I'm not saying incidents haven't happened, but I'm saying that the ratio of incidents compared to the number of you who are delivering professional work and who are doing your work effectively, is way, 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 way beyond anything that you can find elsewhere. And please, nobody has stopped anybody from commenting on anything in Ghana. Nobody has stopped anybody from commenting on anything in Ghana. So the few people who comment and go beyond the limits, and of course, even in the Constitution, there are limits. Limits mm. based on public health and public safety for journalists. I we say that journalists should break those limits without any uh, reason and get away with it because they are journalists and that the state cannot protect the state? I we say that the state cannot protect the state from journalists who go beyond the pale? I, I, I am grateful to you. Approach. I am grateful to you, Director of Communications of the NPP. Unfortunately, we've run out of time and I'm grateful for your time this evening. We should talk more. Folks, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront. Many thanks to you for joining us.